Good morning, everybody. I see everybody rolling in um, what is an early morning for our West Coast friends and um, lunchtime for our East Coast friends. So thank you all so much for joining this really um, special, important, and great opportunity to listen and learn. My name is Kelsey Herbert, and I'm the National Campaigns Director with Faith in Public Life. And I'm so excited to be here with all 146. Our numbers are growing of you who um, are taking time out of your day today to have a really crucial conversation in a really important time in our country. Um, I'm here, I'm excited that we're here to explore together, that we're here to learn together, and we're here to learn how we can act uh, for justice for our communities um, in the face of the injustice that we are experiencing now and the injustice that we've been experiencing for centuries and decades in this country. So I'm so excited that our numbers are growing. We are here together um, this morning. Um, and I'm really excited to work with the Working Families Party who have been working on this issue with the Movement for Black Lives um, and the, the content that they will share, I think will be really uh, important. So we are recording this. Please think through the, this conversation, who you would have wanted to have been here. Who do you wanna share this conversation with? Maybe your congregation, maybe your pastor, maybe your faith leader or your family. Um, let them be in this space with us. Uh, and to begin, I'm really excited to welcome Patia Thomas, who is a Columbus-based activist, organizer, and artist, and also a member of St. John's UCC, who's gonna remind us why we're here as people of faith to have this important conversation. So Patia, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Kelsey. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about why uh, it is important for, for us as people of faith to be part of this conversation around defunding police. And it's important mainly because um, people of faith who believe in justice and mercy cannot, we cannot afford to continue to uphold or support institutions that perpetuate violence against its citizens and um, that uphold white supremacy. Um, I want to start off with a little story um, that I found fascinating. It's uh, a story from the book of Revelation, um, but it talks about um, in 81 through 96 BC, or I'm sorry, CE, um, that's what they're calling it now, uh, there was a Roman emperor named Domitian who, um, who had declared himself a god which was kind of extravagant because most um, other emperors at the time were not deified until they were dead. So um, as it was customary, people were um, required to worship uh, the emperor and um, all of the cult that surrounded it. And so um, during this time, the churches that were being established in Asia uh, for Christianity were, you know, working through ways in which they could navigate this system and still keep their faith. And so this particular region called Laodicea uh, was, was a wealthy region. And um, the Jews in that region were not required to follow this command. So they were, they were exempted from you know, the worship of this emperor. Uh, however, Christians were not. And so at that time, most Christian converts were Jewish. And so as long as uh, Christianity or whatever it was called at the time was a sect within Judaism, it was, they were safe from having to, you know, worship uh, Domitian. Um, but as more non-Jewish or what were referred to as Gentile people uh, converted to Christianity, then, um, then they ultimately had to make a decision. Would they worship this emperor or would they um, face the consequences, which were interestingly not being allowed to buy and sell and participate in commerce. So it was, uh, you were forced into poverty in a wealthy region if you did not worship 
you know, this emperor's ego. And so the writer uh, who was writing Revelations sent out his letters to the churches in Asia. And um, the, the story was about, um, was about vacillating between two points. And so the people in Laodicea struggled with whether they would keep their faith and honor their faith or they would worship because keeping their faith meant facing poverty. So they had to make an economic decision with their moral values. And so to them, the writer said that this is, you're as lukewarm water. And God told them that if you're lukewarm, I will, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And so I, I share this story because it is important for us to make make solid decisions about our faith. And um, I reference the, we, the mayor of Columbus right now has, has found himself in this position. And this is because the people are, the people are demanding a defunding of the police. Um, and the FOP or the Fraternal Order of Police is demanding status quo. And so as we've watched our mayor try to make this decision, he's neither supporting the people um, nor giving the Fraternal Order of Police what they want. And so now nobody wants to support. He has, as it were, um, symbolically been spewed out of everyone's mouth because he can't make a decision. So um, I share that story just to, just to highlight why it's important to pick a side. And it's not always an easy choice, uh, especially when our options are removal of, you know, supports and financial things that can help us. Um, when it when our economics are tied to it, it makes it very difficult to pick a side. And so sometimes we want to use words, uh, softer words, uh, to to address reform and. We want to say, well, let's demilitarize or use easier or more palatable words uh, to help with this. But um, I like to reference Dr. King when I talk about reform and soft words and how they just haven't, that has gotten us nowhere um, when it comes to the way Black human beings are being murdered by police every day. So I'll read this quote. We as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revelation of value, revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. <clears throat> he goes on to say in another lecture that talking about people in poverty and oppressed people, if they can be helped to take action together, they will do so with a freedom and a power that will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. And so as we watch, you know, taking down statues and painting Black Lives Matter on streets and, you know, protesting together, you know, changing, changing the term master bedroom to some less racist term, um, removing racist mascots from sports imagery, all of these things are welcome and they, and, and we're thankful, um, but they're not going to stop a militarized police force from killing black human beings. And so this is why we need to 
to be strong in our resolve uh, as people of faith for this revolution um, in which we find ourselves today. Thank you for letting me share that. Thank you so much, uh, Patia. And yeah, we are in a we're in a moment where we're being asked to decide where where will we stand. So um, thank you for that framing, Patia. And now I'm really excited to dig in and invite Steve Hughes and Jennifer Knox from the Working Families Party to deliver this outstanding training for all of us. So Steve, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for having us here with you today. Um, we just, Jennifer and I wanted to do just by way of introduction, just to say, um, and thank you, Patia, for, uh, for sharing that. That was really great. Um, but just by way of introducing ourselves, we'll say just a little bit about who we are, um, and then we'll jump into things. Um, my name is uh, Steve Hughes. And I've been uh, with the Working Families Party for about 10 years now. Um, and uh, I come out of the United States labor movement. That was my pathway into uh, this work. But um, I'm really happy and excited to be here today because um, the, this is an interesting, inter this training, this group, this time is a really interesting intersection uh, of a couple of different parts of who I am and things that I grew up kind of seeing and learning. First being that um, I grew up Catholic and specifically I grew up the son of a Catholic priest. Uh, my father was a priest for a good number of years before um, deciding to take a different life path um, and, but he remains very committed to the church his whole life. And I grew up going to church, um, weekly. And that was just very much part of who I was, who I am and how I was brought up. Um, but when he left the church, he was looking for work, um, which is not always easy to do when you're middle-aged and have spent your whole life learning Latin and not something else. <laughs> um, so he um, ended up, after bouncing around for a while, working in the correction system um, and as a counselor, first in the state of New Jersey and then the state of Arizona where I was born and then eventually in the state of Washington where I grew up. Um, so he basically had a career working as a counselor in the prison system for uh, a number, a number of years. And he didn't talk a lot about work. He kind of kept that separate. But I do remember as a little kid, one thing that he said, just as an offhand remark that has stuck with me to this day. I don't know why. It's just the kind of thing you notice when you're a little kid. Uh, maybe because it was the way he said it and you could just tell there was something behind it. He said to me, or he said out loud even, I don't know if it was even directly to me. He said, they just don't treat people there like humans. And I remember him saying that in the context of being in some sort of fight with his boss. I don't really know what it was about. I remember he eventually had the union involved. I remember it was kind of a deal. Um, it was also my first exposure to like what being a union family meant. <laughs> um, but it also was my little intersection between uh, a person who was a role model for faith in my life and this large and growing system that now we're talking about in real ways of fundamentally altering the police and carceral state that we live in. So I'm just really happy to be here because this really unites a couple different threads in my life. So that's a little bit about who I am and I'll let Jennifer say a little bit about who she is. Hey y'all, I'm Jennifer Knox, she, her, and I'm calling in from Washington, DC. Uh, I'm currently the National Organizing Director for the Working Families Party. And uh, before that, I actually was the lead organizer for Washington Interfaith Network uh, in Washington, DC. So I spent the last ooh, 10 plus years of my life organizing faith congregations uh, and trying to get them into concrete action and have tons of fond memories of the ways that faith 
uh, individuals of faith in their congregations have helped organize to move millions of dollars into things like affordable housing and youth programs. Things that I think really Start. address the root causes um, of the lack of safety in our communities. Um, and, you know, so I'm just confident that we can really uh, be successful with divest and best strategies that come to this work having like seen faith congregations really show up in ways that meaningfully um, shift our communities. Uh, and I also show up just as a black woman who was raised in Madison, Wisconsin. It is uh, one of the places with the highest disparity of black people in the prison system versus the community. And so it meant for me watching my brother at age five, literally in kindergarten, get fingerprinted at his school for throwing rocks on the playground uh, and one hitting a car, when I am certain that his father, right, or somebody or a teacher could have dealt with that issue better than a police. So uh, I come with some personal experiences around just like the harms that happen in our communities when we overinvest in policing and not enough in making sure that our communities are genuinely safe and thriving. Uh, so with that said, uh, we're going to kick off this training, um, and uh, Steve, I think, is going to do a little bit of housekeeping, um, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Cool. Um, yeah, the housekeeping here, we're going to... Steve, I think you're still on mute. Um, really? Can you not hear me? You're all set, Steve. Okay, good. Um, just took a second to lag in it. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we made Kelsey's life difficult by uh, saying that we want this to be interactive. Um, so she had to scramble to change a bunch of stuff and thank you to uh, you, Kelsey, for doing that. But this is also our way of saying that we don't want this to be uh, just a one-way interaction. This is a really large group, obviously, so it's gonna be a little bit hard to get, you know, super, super conversational, but we do have some times in the program where we're gonna have some small group opportunities. Um, I say that also as a, a, an advanced warning to some of you folks who are maybe sitting there with your cameras off and uh, uh, just know in about 10 minutes or so, you're gonna be in a small group. Um, so, you know, make sure you have all your clothes on, make sure you're ready to go for that. Um, uh, because that's gonna happen in a little bit and we do wanna have interaction, even if it means we have to put up with some haters trying to jump in on our meeting, that's better uh, than you know sitting here kind of all in our own little cells um, on these Zoom windows when we could be talking with one another. So that's uh, housekeeping point Main, main number one. Uh, I see people are already dropping in the chat where you're from. That's really exciting to see folks from all over the country. Um, really great. Um, and uh, we're going to go over just a couple ground rules here, a um, couple agreement agreements between us. So just quickly, by a show of hands, for those of you who are, who are on camera, how many of you have found yourself in a situation where you've been talking about something that made you feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'll just raise your hand if that's... So I think that's a pretty universal experience. Um, and we're going to be talking about some kind of some heavy stuff today, um, you know, about police, oppression, about uh, racism and all of the things that have been baked into our uh, system in the United States for a very long time. Um, and so it might make us feel a little bit uncomfortable, but the first thing that we want to center as, a, as an agreement here is that this is a brave space, if people are familiar with that, that we are giving ourselves permission to be brave, to feel those feelings, and to also um, know that those aren't enough, those aren't feelings that just need to shut us down, those are feelings we can lean into and learn from. Um, next is uh, what happens here stays here, but what's learned here leaves here. Um, so that's the basic agreement here that people might share something. We shouldn't go and then say, oh my goodness. And if you're all on Twitter, which I'm not tweeted out that so-and-so said something and blah, blah, blah. That's not what this space is for. We're not here to uh, call anybody out. 
Um, but we are here to learn. And hopefully the things that you learn, you can take out into the world and help um, bring that information to other people. Um, avoiding jargon and acronyms, that's pretty standard. We're gonna try to do that as the presenters as well. If you're in small groups, just be aware of that. Um, we're also gonna try to be aware of time. Uh, and if you feel like you've been in your small group and you look around, you're the only one who's been talking for 10 minutes, maybe that's a time to be aware of time. Um, and uh, just really quick, ask the group, you can put it in the chat, um, if there are any other uh, rules or agreements that you think we should have on the table. You can just put them in the chat. I see somebody putting in the chat here that they don't feel comfortable being in a small group. You'll have, if, if that's the case, you'll get an invitation to join the small group and you don't have to click on it to accept if, if, if that's a, a, a challenge for you. So you don't have to go into the small group. Um, you'll kind of be stranded in, in uh, no man's land of Zoom for a little while while others are in the group, but just uh, thanks for bringing that up. Speaking of brave space, thank you. Um, all right, so I see this here, golden rule of small group conversation, limit your comments to 30 seconds. Yes. Okay, so let's, um, and I'll just drop those in the chat so people have them to refer back to. Um, okay. So now what I want to do to get us started here is um, have everybody just get comfortable in the seat you're sitting in. Um, if you're standing, get comfortable on your feet. Um, and just everybody with me, if you want, you can close your eyes if you feel comfortable and just take a deep breath in. Now, and take another one. And another one. And if you're feeling a little tension in your body and your shoulders and your neck, just feel that and try to let it go. If you're still feeling a little bit strange about those haters coming into our space, this is the time we can just let it go. Feel your feet planted firmly on the ground. And I want you to imagine that you're in a situation that you are completely safe. Think about what that space looks like. You could be the age you are now, or you could be sometime in your childhood or any age at all. Just think about a time when you felt completely safe. What does that look like to you? What does looking completely safe look like to you? Where are you? Who's there with you? Who's not there? What sounds do you hear? What does it smell like in your safe place? And what are you doing there? What feelings do you feel while you're in this safe place?
Think about that. And while you're thinking about it, just take another breath in. in. And out. Okay. So what we're going to do now is uh, break up into some small groups for just a few minutes. Um, you'll have 15 minutes in your small groups. And in that time, you'll have the opportunity to introduce yourself, your name, where you're calling in from, what pronouns you choose to go by. Um, you can share what your vision of safety looks like. Um, and specifically, whether the, the question of whether the police were present in your vision of safety. And um, what, the final question is, what are the experiences with police that you enter into with, like, what do you enter into this space with in terms of experiences with police, good or bad? You can just say those things. So I'm gonna draw going to take some feedback from the discussions from you using a platform called Menti. Um, and where I, I need you to go to a website called, you can, so first of all, who has their, their cell phone, like a smartphone with them sitting nearby? It's like the 21st century, so uh, that tends to be the case that people have it very close by. So um, if you want, it, it, the easiest way to usually do this is to have a phone and have the screen. But if you don't have your smartphone, you can also open a new tab on your computer. Um, but if you do it on your phone, you'll be able to look at this and see what comes up on the screen as we do it. So if you go, go to a web browser on your phone and type in menti.com. I put it in the chat. Oops. And then you're going to see a code at the top. It, it type in the code 93, I see some of you are already in there, 931530. And I see people are already filling it in. You can put in a word that comes up to describe the conversation you just had. One word to describe your vision of safety. It's yeah, menti.com. It's just, it's in the chat. I'm seeing family, community, home, relationship. Lots of great words there. Okay. Lots of great words here. So many I can't even, but family, peace, community, nature, love, warmth. There's some definite ones rising to the top here. Okay, why don't we move to the next slide? Okay, see a pretty uh, strong trend here. Uh, for most of you, your vision of safety did not involve the police. And 
as we go through this training and we talk about the idea of defund the police, um, I think it's important to keep this in mind that uh, for most of us, our vision of safety doesn't involve the police. It involves things like family, community, the things that nurture us. Um, and so when we talk about defund the police and the idea of divest, reinvest, um, let's ground ourselves in the idea that what we're divesting from and instead investing in is the things that we ourselves feel deeply in our bodies as the things that make us feel safe, the things that build community, the things that um, nurture families. Um, and then just quickly, one last slide. What are some of the experiences with the police that you're come, walking in with? There's a lot of choices here. Pick the ones that resonate with you. Okay, so we're walking into this discussion with a variety of experiences with law enforcement. So that's something good for us to hold as we are building a brave space to keep in mind that we're coming at this from different places, different experiences. if I can just clarify in here, it looks like two of them, the law enforcement has harmed people I love, yeah. and the other, uh, the I tend to fear law enforcement are black, so they're not zero, just so people. Yeah, it's weird formatting. It's yep. black on black. <laughs> um, cool. So let's transition here then to, um, Thank, thank you everybody for both your participation in the conversation already, your feedback um, to the conversation. Now what we want to do is we want to transition to um, a conversation about five hard truths about policing. Um, and it's our hope that these hard truths help us untangle some of the falsehoods that we're often picking up living in the United States. and trying to replace them with some clarity that can help us act more strategically in this um, most uh, mo interesting and amazing moment that we find ourselves in. So um, let's get started. And for that, I will pass it to you, Jay Knox. Thanks, Steve. So uh, we're going to dive into these hard truths. And really, our hope for this session was to make it a uh, pretty basic argument. Sometimes we know things in our body maybe and it, or we feel them, but we don't always know how to articulate it. Uh, and so breaking down a little bit of how um, we've gotten to this argument around defund is our goal. And we hope it'll be a space that is both 101 for people who are newer uh, coming into these conversations, but also allow folks that are quite experienced to weigh in as well. So the first hard truth states that it's not about good police or bad police, it's about the policing system. Uh, the bad apple police narrative that is very commonly peddled in our society compares a bad cop to a bad apple and argues one bad apple spoils the, spoils the blunt, bunch. Implicitly, this argues that overall, most police are good people, aka good apples. And if we can just weed out the bad cops, the bad apples, if you will, everything will be okay. And uh, while cute and simple, this is really a false narrative that takes the focus away from the structural reasons why we need to defund the police system. It's important for those of us who believe in pushing to eliminate white supremacy and advancing uh, racial justice to focus on structural racism and systematic inequality rather than boiling things down to just simply personal prejudice. And very often, even if there is an example of an officer who 
uh, exhibits clearly unacceptable uh, behavior uh, that is a result of personal prejudice, prejudice. Let's not take our eye off the system that very often supports uh, and sustains that person. Uh, but overall, we should take in that the problems with policing are beyond bad individuals. They're structural. Uh, so I hear this narrative all the time, uh, and I'm curious, where do you see the bad apple versus good apple narrative show up? And if you'll log it in, uh, in team, oh, great, uh, everybody will be able to see. So yep, media coverage, I see it all the time. Elected officials, absolutely. Whenever we've got the uh, uh, police department after a major shooting, it's like, well, this person was clearly unacceptable behavior and we won't tolerate it, right? It's like, how do we pin this down to a person but not allow uh, for conversation about the broader structural issues? Uh, public meetings, absolutely, which my assumption is that means it's by us, the public, saying it. Uh, Facebook, right? Our friends and family, yep. Our TV shows often like reiterate that there are these bad people that, uh, and that's the problem that we should concern ourselves and keep our eye on. Uh, and if we do that, it actually decreases our ability to create structural change. Awesome. You've got uh, tons of excellent, <laughs> uh, both uh, actual, uh, our current president and, uh, you know, the leading presidential candidate have made statements that are similar to this of, you know, this is unacceptable and we can't support these individuals. So that's very true. All right, thank you for all your wonderful answers. We won't get through them all. Um, and where are you on the bad apple narrative? Does this make sense to you? Do you support the bad apple narrative now uh, after this breakdown? Have you believed this in the last year, you know, or more recently um, or in the past? And do you feel you can educate others on this narrative given uh, the talking points? And we'll be, uh, leaving you all with a handout that puts those talking points out. All right, so we still got shifts happening, but it sounds like I've been successful in making this argument. Very few people uh, uh, believe this bad apple narrative now. Um, and it seems like some of the shift has happened uh, in the last year uh, that Many people kind of came into this year, it seems like, with this argument, more or less. That's starting to shift a little bit. But when we see about, you know, almost half of us are willing to acknowledge that, yep, I've said some version of this before. And so I just want to make this, again, a safe space that, like, a lot of us, you know, as we've kind of progressed in our analysis, have maybe um, made these statements. And when other people make them to us, let's see if we can show up with some compassion uh, knowing that very often we've been that person before, but also some, some correction, right? Uh, and hopefully we can kind of simplify what's the simple falsity in that argument uh, and how easy it is to pick it up in our society, but we really do have to combat that as good as we, um, as well as we can. Uh, and good, it seems like folks are feeling confident that this is simple enough. It is very common, right? But it is a simple uh, pushback that you can be making uh, and just, uh, clarifying for yourself, but also making with other people around you. Awesome. I think we're headed to our next point. And Steve, are you opening this up? Yes. First, I had to take myself off mute. Um, so the next hard truth uh, is one that we're going to look at through the lens of history. And you'll see on your screen here, uh, policing in the USA. 1492 to the present. Um, so this is gonna be the long sweep of history of the United States here. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Oh wait, not yet actually. We're gonna to go to the, sorry, my bad. I'm gonna drop a link here in a second into the chat. And what it is, is it's going to be a timeline of uh, the history of policing in the United States. And the hard truth that we're looking to um, explore here is that policing has a racist and capitalist origin in the United States. And that in fact, the system of policing is not actually broken. Uh, if you look at the history, it's functioning exactly as it was meant to. Um, so we're going to look at a timeline you're gonna have about seven minutes to go through this on your own in quiet study time, if you will. 
I'm going to warn you now that it's a lot of information. You're probably not going to get through all of the information in this timeline. It's going to be kind of like the experience of running through a museum at, right before they close and you're just trying to skim all of the exhibits before they throw you out. But um, it's going to give you just an overview of history in, of policing in the United States. So um, while you're doing that, just note what you're feeling, what trends you're seeing, and what does this tell you about the nature of policing? So let me grab the link. I'm gonna drop, drop it in the chat here. So in the chat, you should see a link that will take you to uh, a website with a timeline on it. And you go ahead and take a look at that and we'll give you seven minutes to go through it. And I'll set my clock.
Take about two more minutes. Okay, read that last section to the end and then we'll come back as a larger group. Okay. So I definitely realized that there's a lot of information in there and you definitely did not get it to the end, but as Kelsey pointed out, we will share that so you can uh, read it more fully later. And just to give credit to the sources there, that's a combination of research from an organization called Critical Resistance that for a very long time has been leading on work on decarceration, additional research from the Working Families Party and the Movement for Black Lives all put together and none other than Jennifer on the call here assembled it all into that beautiful timeline. So, um, so if I could ask everybody to go back to Menti, we're gonna keep uh, having the conversation that we've been having here. So first of all, uh, when you're back on Menti, and if you for some reason closed it and need to go back, menti.com, here, I'll drop it in the chat again, uh, menti.com, and the code is Okay. Okay, lots of answers here. I see the big ones are overwhelmed, angry, sad, uh, unsettled, disgusted. I see empowered in there, shocked, um, heavy. So a lot of emotions uh, in that history that they're bringing up for folks. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And I lost it, but I'm sure you have it in front of you. <laughs> what did you learn about the history of policing? It's racist beginnings, long history, privatization to public, uh, somebody says, I know this stuff, not surprised, hateful, nasty, it is systemic. Janox, can you scroll that a little bit so we can see more? Long use of violence, the system has been broken, it was never created to protect black people. It's about maintaining the status quo, which is racist, focus on control of black bodies, Design of control of non-whites, always about control. Okay, lot. So yeah, lots of 
similar themes coming up in here. Um, and then one last, uh, or another slide here. What trends did you notice, if any? Corruption grows and grows, violence, racist, local action plus federal reinforcement, uh, white forces, black and brown bodies, moving towards militarism as a trend, reaction or response to uprising, violent and violence. Janox, if you can scroll a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of the same things in these. Um, so yeah, just to kind of summarize this, uh, or actually let's see the last slide here, because I'm just curious to see how people would add to this timeline. I saw somebody in the chat add something already, but what would you add to the timeline, either from uh, moments that were important to you personally or to your community or to the country? What would you add to this timeline? Folks can drop them in the chat. I don't think we made a slide for that. But ah, got it. Let's uh, have those right. ideas. A growing project based on, you know, all of our, our deep knowledge. And yes, we'll restate uh, truth number two in just a second. Yes. Okay. So again, to summarize and to restate, truth number two is that policing has racist and capitalist origins. The system of policing is not broken. It functions exactly as it was meant to. And some of the points that I think you were all bringing out in this is that our policing system reinforces the oppressive social and economic relationships that are part of America's original sins um, and that the roots of policing in the United States are closely linked to the capture of escaped slaves, murder of indigenous peoples, and enforcement of black codes. And similarly, police forces have been used to keep new immigrants in line and prevent poor and working class folks from making demands. So uh, as social conditions change, how policing is used to target uh, poor people, brown people, black people, indigenous people, immigrants, um, and others who do not conform uh, on uh, conform on the street or in their homes also shifts. Um, but uh, the harm is nevertheless very powerful. But and always targets the least powerful in the society. So, Jane Ups, do you want to take us to definition of policing here? You're on mute. Uh, sure. Uh, so actually, if you folks want to drop in the chat, um, do you have a definition of policing given what we've taken in? And maybe, uh, Kelsey, let me know if this is doable, but if we can have maybe one or two people speak up and say it, uh, I think you might be able to raise your hand. And if that's not possible, it's, we might have disabled your ability to speak, uh, you know, just because of the issues earlier. So Kelsey will let us know. Let's give it a try. Awesome. So if you want to offer up what you think might be a definition of policing uh, verbally, raise your hand. I think you do that uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Kelsey, do you want to describe where it is? Maybe it's in the chat area. I'm not sure to raise your hand, but why don't you go ahead and put in the chat and I can then. Okay. Got it. It's in the participants menu. Does anybody want to go ahead and, uh, you know, if so, we'll unmute you so that you can uh, say what you think the definition might be. Oh, 
it looks like maybe Eileen's hand is up. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I was a little late and I'm sorry about that, but this has been incredibly informative and um, police need to be defunded because I, I'm a social work major and the, poli the police are not equipped to take on mental health issues and, and issues. M most quote unquote deviant, if you want to, whatever, for lack of a better word, behavior comes from people that are struggling with mental health issues. You know, what society would view as deviant, a social worker would view as, you know, someone crying out for help. And that's what I, I really, you know, the more I learn, I've learned over, because I've chosen to educate myself over the past um, two months that everything's been going on, you know, and uh, it's just, I agree, I read them. Yeah, sorry, thanks. No, we choose to respond to those cries for help with incarceration, right? And, and very often escalation of violence um, instead of listening and, and seeking to resolve the root issue. Did you have any suggestion on what a definition of policing might be that you wanted to offer up, I mean? Um, one thing that I, believe and, and I'm I, I'm not even quite sure how to how to say all this but when for instance if police are going out on a domestic violence call where there's a potential for a, a weapon to be used um, I I think that social workers need to be brought out on those kinds of calls if they're dealing with someone who's um, you know drunk and disorderly or driving while intoxicated I mean you know, you need to have social workers there, you know, you just do. I 100% agree that we're often responding uh, maybe to the wrong problem, uh, but certainly with the wrong, you know, solution. I'm going to toss up, I see great stuff in the chat around, lots around power and control and maintaining the status quo. The definition that we are going to put forward is that policing is a social relationship and a set of practices that are backed by the state to enforce law and social control. So some people definitely got that part of it uh, through the use of force. Um, and that resonates in the chat with people's uh, articulation about the violence that's inherent in that. Uh, the state makes choices about which people to target, what to target them for, and when to arrest and book them. Uh, and especially in the United States, knowing that our police system was created back uh, during slavery times, where it was very clear that the goal of the police was to target black and indigenous people, right? Not to target white people, uh, to target them for um, very often property crimes, right? If you remember, uh, like so much of the rise of policing is related to quote unquote property crimes. At one time, black people were actually property. And the goal of the police was to, to bring back that, that property to the white owner, if you will. Um, and you know when to arrest and book people and we know that that has not played out equally um and so a system where those choices were set up in the usa in a very i think we'd all agree now egregious manner uh this is uh what leads us to this uh truth number two uh which i think may be repeated on this next slide let me see if i can get us there that policing has racist and capitalist origins the system of policing is not broken, but it's functioning exactly as it was meant to. Uh, and so that should really, I hope, call us all to question, can I support a system that is actually doing what it was created to do very well um, when our values as a society about what is okay uh, should, should have changed dramatically. Uh, and so I use this you know, argument with a lot of people who, um, you know, I think, uh, really believe that that the policing system is set up to protect and serve and that maybe it's a aberration when it causes harm but actually no that's not the origin of this system it's not factually correct and uh, we invite you all to share this timeline uh, very widely with your friends and family um, and we're going to be updating it as you go as we go so thank you all for your comments around that um, let me see what's next here so where are you after hard truth number two? Uh, does this argument that we've made, uh, does it make sense to you? Is that something that uh, you believe as well, that policing has racist and capitalist origins? Um, 
do you believe that the entire policing system, you know, system, right? Not every police as an individual, but the system is predicated on violence and control. Uh, and that the system of policing is not broken, that it's actually functioning exactly as it was meant to. What do y'all think? All right, it's looking like we've got uh, a high level of consensus around that. Oh, okay, and here's the, uh, we already caught this in the chat, so I'm gonna keep us going around just like, what would you add? Uh, so the next section, uh, we're gonna seek to answer this question of does, in, does uh, increasing police actually decrease violence? Is that correlated uh, together or not? So it may feel like common sense, but I wanna ask you all, when do police show up most often? If you can drop that in the chat, when do the police show up? At what point in maybe a quote unquote crime? Yep, <laughs> yep, all right, we, there's a group consensus that generally the police almost always show up after a crime has been committed. Uh, on occasion, maybe during or before preventatively, but like realistically, no, they show up afterwards. So I think we can intuit some of this, uh, that how exactly are police decreasing crime by showing up after the fact? Very often their job is to prosecute crimes and maybe incarcerate after harm has been done, but not actually to prevent it. Uh, but so let's look at the numbers uh, on this. Uh, the, in short, the cost of policing is high and it's increasing. The U.S. spends an estimated $100 billion on the police force annually, with another $80 billion a year spent on incarceration across the country. Policing typically, typically accounts for one-third to 60% of an American city's annual budget. That's uh, policing and in incarceration. And much of the increase in law and order spending stems from the war on drugs in the 1980s and 90s, which required massive, massive investment in police and prisons, in part due to mandatory minimum sentences uh, and also decreasing a police officer's ability to decide uh, what they target and prosecute people for. Um, today, costs are rising even more because among the next generation, there are fewer and fewer recruits showing up to be new police. And so if you look at your city's budget, one of the things you may see is that because young people are not as interested in this profession, it leads cities to pay out massive retention bonuses to keep the cops that they have. And so it is more expensive each year to maintain the exact same uh, size police force. So we know the costs of policing are high and are increasing, but what does it get us? Research is conflicting at best. Uh, adding more cops to a violent city seems like an obvious fix mentally, but there's actually conflicting research on the question of whether cops actually reduce the amount of crimes committed, not whether they prosecute those crimes, right? But whether they reduce uh, uh, crime, which I think is all of our goal is we wanna see less harm in society. So take this example from New York City. After the 2014 protests around the non-indictment of Officer Darren Warren uh, and the murder of Michael Brown, two New York police officers were killed by a young man with mental health issues. Do folks remember that? Angry New York officers were legally prohibited from striking at that time, but they unofficially coordinated a long-term slowdown uh, in policing. So officers were explicitly instructed to respond to calls only in pairs and to perform only the most crucial duties. Uh, they were even told not to leave their squad cars unless they felt compelled. Uh, so what happened in those two months? If more policing reduces crime, then, it then we would expect that less policing should lead to more crime. But in fact, the Washington Post found, and this article will be linked in the, um, in the handout, uh, that actually, um, it, we could actually kind of guess that more, uh, so, sorry, that there was a reduction in the amount of kind of violations for minor offenses. So there were fewer par parking fines and fewer disorderly conduct uh, charges on people who maybe were intoxicated um, in public. All of those things went down 40 to 66%. But get this, reports actually of major crimes, murder, rape, felony assault, burglary, and grand larcenery were all declined. Um, and so actually it did not demonstrate that reducing the police force 
uh, pre presence uh, led to more crime. That was not true in that, at least during that period of this study. Uh, and it's hard to get good examples um, of times to study, but that is a critical one that researchers invested in. Another study found that the use of SWAT teams, which is perhaps the most common and visible form of militarized policing, neither reduces crime nor enhances public safety. And also it was reported that there was a correlation with this aggressive approach to law enforcement being disproportionately used in minority communities. Even the industry of police consultants agrees that the results of increasing officers are inconclusive. And my guess is that this industry in part uh, has, has acknowledged that more police doesn't increase policing because it's very hard for them to find more police recruits. The, the amount that they spend recruiting people basically means that they should argue that, well, you need to right size your police force. They, they used to say, you know, bigger city, more violence needs more cops. And now they say, oh, you need to right size it. They've backed off of that because they can't actually prove that more policing increases safety. Uh, furthermore, and Eileen mentioned this excellently, most often budget increases to policing departments means that armed cops are doing more and more roles in society. Nowadays, police are performing homelessness services, working with children in schools, responding to calls for mental health crises, performing social work and welfare checks, mediating domestic disputes, and responding to drug overdoses. Often they are not trained, Eileen named this, they are not trained to perform these tasks. One could argue having armed offices, officers handling these interactions escalates situations and actually creates more violence, not less. People who respond to community crisis should be people best equipped to deal with those crises, uh, but most of social service agencies and organizations that could serve as alternatives to the police are underfunded, scrambling for grant money year after year just to stay alive uh, while being, uh, while, uh, and also while being forced to interact with police officers that sometimes make their job harder to do. Uh, I know that all of us are seeking solutions to violence. I deeply want that for the community that I live in and for each of us. Uh, but I do think that we're so desperately wanting to live in safe communities. Uh, but simply put, boiling this complex issue down to adding more police is not the right approach to increasing safety. Uh, and so this leads us to hard truth number three, that despite our investment in policing, it does not actually prevent violence. This is a repeat. Sorry, I should have put this up here as I was going. So hard truth number three, increasing police, there's not evidence that it actually prevents or decreases violence. So next time a politician, uh, we all talked about this, knocks on your door about increasing police to keep you safe, what are you going to say to them? Let us know in Menti. Again, the code is, it's at menti.com and the code is 931530. <laughs> You've gotta know, we're gonna tell them defund. Instead, we keep us safe. Hey, not the police. Show me the data, right, absolutely. To keep who safe? Will my black neighbors be safer? Uh, will my unhoused neighbors be safer? You're gonna say no, put more uh, money into affordable housing and social services. Um, we need community actions, not more police. No thank you, no increase, uh, recreate. Uh, Folks are gonna say, no, my neighbors keep me uh, safe. All right, so just recognize that of the uh, $100 billion in policing money that's spent annually in the US, most of that is happening at the local level. So we actually as citizens have large amounts of control over whether we continue to increase police budgets year after year, or whether we turn around and start to decrease the amount of money that we invest in policing. Uh, so I think uh, this leads us to, uh, Steve's gonna talk to us about truth number four. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. I um, just wanna say that the chat has been super active and it's really hard for us to keep up with it. So uh, we're doing our best to focus on both, but if we miss something important in the chat, hopefully uh, it will get answered as we roll here. Um, so hard truth number four. 
the U.S. invests more in policing, incarceration, and militarization than, than in students and in reducing poverty. So there is uh, another cost to spending so much uh, on policing, um, which is a so-called solution to violence that, as Jane Knox was just pointing out, it's not actually proven. Um, and investing in so much in policing means that we can't invest as much in the things that have been proven to work to create pre peace and safety in our communities. Um, for example, research has shown that the relationship between uh, high school graduation rates and crime rates um, and that there's a relationship between educational attainment, attainment and the likelihood of incarceration. So uh, this may sound intuitive, but doesn't always guide our policy. Uh, higher graduation rates were associated with pub positive public safety outcomes. Um, and in fact, researchers have found that a 5% increase in male high school graduation rates would produce an annual savings of almost $5 billion in crime-related expenses. So um, not a bad investment if you will get it through those terms. Um, states with higher college enrollment rates um, and, that make in bigger, and that make bigger investments in higher education, these states also experience lower violent crime. And of the 10 states that saw the biggest increases in higher education expenditure, eight of those states saw violent crime rates decrease. And, uh, five, uh, and the five that saw violent crime decline more than the national average. Um, so again, investing in education works. Um, I see slide not active here, but education <laughs> matters. <laughs> um, so, uh, some cities will push back and argue that their overall local budget does not fund schools more than policing, incarceration, and the military. Yep. Uh, we can argue over that. But the point here is that when you only look at the local and state levels, this may be right. Uh, many states are spending approximately 7% of their budgets on policing and corrections. But the point here is that that 7% of the budget is spent on a relatively small number of prisoners, um, given the broader population. And that the higher cost of caring for people in prisons 24 hours a day, uh, and the higher number of workers required to operate prisons means that taxpayers are actually spending uh, $31,286 a year on an incarcerated person as opposed to $12,201 on a secondary school student. Um, so we have even put, uh, we've put so much into policing at, that officers are regularly working with schools and students. I don't know, do people on this call just by raise of hand, raising your hand, if you have children or know people with children whose children are in schools, oh, sorry, kids invasion. Uh, have police officers in the school? I see hands. Yes. So um, the statistics on that are that these so-called school resource officers, there are approximately 14 to 20,000 officers in about 30% of the nation's schools. And those numbers began to increase after the, the Columbine High School shooting in 1999. But there is no evidence to show that expanding law enforcement by adding school resource officers actually results in safer schools. And this is the origin of the cops out of school movement, if you're familiar with that. Um, so when we need to add in the federal money spent on police, military, and immigration and customs enforcement, ICE, uh, it's proven uh, we, we need to add that in. And it's proven that less poverty and living wages decreases crime. Again, some of this stuff is intuitive, but it doesn't always guide policy um, for some of the reasons we were talking about earlier. Um, just to put this in perspective, these are numbers you may be familiar with. At the federal level, we spent uh, $6 trillion, uh, on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And we spend $100 billion a year on 
uh, policing in the United States. And the slides don't seem to be keeping up with me. Jane Ox, could you advance the... Cool, here we are. So um, there is, uh, just to put those numbers in comparison to a few uh, proposals that you could fund in the United States, it's estimated that to end homelessness in the United States, it would take $20 billion a year. Um, I see hands and I'll get through this slide and then uh, you can, if you can put your question in the chat maybe is to help speed us up, keep us going here, but uh, universal pre-K would be 26 billion, baby bonds, which is essentially a proposal where the government would invest in babies at birth um, at, based on their income. Uh, family income would cost $60 billion a year and eliminating poverty with, for families with children would be 70 billion. Uh, I see raised hands and I'm gonna look to Kelsey here for a time check on how much time we have to, to take hands. I love hands, I love discussion, but I wanna respect people's time and Kelsey, give me a, a reality okay. check. Let Rebecca chime in. Okay. Go ahead, Rebecca. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, your yeah. hand was up. Oh, it was up from when you had asked about police and school previous. Uh, that hand doesn't go down. Nope, I'm good. Got it. All right. Great. Um, so we'll keep rolling here. Um, so yeah, uh, a thin safety net and an expansive security state. This is essentially the American way. Um, and at all levels of government, the country spends roughly double on police, prisons, and courts what it spends on food stamps, welfare, and income supplements. So at the federal level, it spends twice as much on the Pentagon as on assistance programs, and eight times as much on defense as on education. So again, this is maybe not new to you, but when we talk about the, the idea of defund, it's important to have some of these numbers in our head to give us some perspective. Uh, because ultimately, budgets are moral documents. Um, and a nation and a city's budget illustrates where its priorities lie. And right now, we don't have the money to make sure our hospitals have enough uh, protective gear, but we have enough money to put military grade weapons in the hands of police officers. Um, so this uh, is, Truth number four, that the U.S. invests more in policing, incarceration, and militarization than in students and reducing poverty. Let's go to Menti real quick. You guys are going to be Menti experts by the end of this. So menti.com, and the code is 931530. I'm gonna take a temperature check of the room. Where are we at? Okay. I see only, we have consensus, but only one person has voted so far, so. <laughs> All right, now we're. Okay. Yeah, so this is sort of teasing out this question of uh, do we abolish these things? Do we divest, reinvest? There's, this is like the current debate and we're gonna talk about that very, very shortly. So um, let's just keep rolling so we can stay on track with time here. The next slide. Um, so just to reiterate the hard truth so far it's not about good police or bad police. It's a systemic discussion. Uh, policing has racist and capitalist origins and the system of policing, the system of policing is not broken. It's functioning exactly as the way it was meant to. Um, police, it's hard truth number three, policing doesn't work to prevent or decrease violence. 
And hard truth number four, we invest more in policing and incarceration than students um, and reducing poverty. Jaina, do you wanna take it from here? Yeah. Uh, so what does defund the police mean? It seems like we're hungry for this uh, in the chat. Um, so it's from these hard truths that the demand to defund policing are coming from. So defunding the police is shorthand for divest and invest. Uh, it's a model uh, that argues that we should divest money from local and state police budgets and reinvest it into communities, mental health services, and social services programs. It's often also shorthand for uh, both local but also federal demands. Uh, and even though defund the police is a shorthand, a lot of times I think what it is arguing is not only defunding uh, and decreasing spending on police, incarceration, uh, detention of immigrants, and the military and investing more in programs that reduce poverty and reduce the wealth gaps that we see in the US that are really much higher than other countries. Some of you uh, don't like the word defund. This is like super common. Um, and I'll be honest with you uh, that the word is using, being used today partially one, because it polls better than abolish the police, which was you know a slogan that was a little bit more uh, utilized in past tense, but also just because it like, people uh, took it up on the ground. And so there wasn't actually an organization that said we should say defund the police. It started being used uh, in protests. And uh, you know, I think there are moments where it's important to echo the words of the people. Uh, and so that's a little bit how we got there. But if for your organization or your institution, defund the police, you feel like is gonna turn people off unnecessarily, uh, I would strongly suggest you talk about divest and invest as a model. Uh, and that helps make sure that you stay in line with, um, with what uh, organizations like ours and social movements are really requesting. What we don't wanna talk about is reforming the police, all right? So a divest and invest model is about structural change. Uh, also, uh, I think that some people react negatively to defund because they feel like it means like defund now and overnight. But I think there is a lot of knowledge among grassroots organizations that this will not happen overnight, that ending police violence will require thoughtful, deliberate, and participatory approaches uh, that have already begun in many cities like Minneapolis. Uh, so the extent to which that we should defund or divest uh, candidly is gonna be different depending on who you ask. There's some uh, people, and there's like a theory um, uh, there around abolition. And so there are some people that are abolitionists who would argue zero funding for police is what we should be going to. Zero funding for police, the military, and ICE. And this is because they envision a world where we can completely replace police with civilian and community-oriented means of keeping our communities safe that are not grounded in white supremacy. Uh, and I think there is a compelling argument that uh, our police infrastructure is so rotten with the history of slavery and slave catching that actually it is not uh, an institution that we should be trying to adjust. We should be uh, trying to replace it actually in, in entirety. But some people will argue that uh, if they're not uh, necessarily an abolitionist, they will still argue given all of the evidence that we, there needs to be a significant decrease. Uh, and we're thinking tens of millions of dollars uh, and even up to hundreds of millions of dollars per city in the amount that we spend on policing and military. And that's because of the argument of the ways that police uh, spending is going up and that the lack of evidence and also the uh, ways that we're seeing police and incarceration spending begin to rise over spending on other uh, strategies that we feel like are, are much more proven. Um, so, uh, you know, we're hoping that folks who have heard this argument at least land in the place of significant decrease in supporting that. And I think the last slide showed that there's a lot of support for that. And there's actually quite a bit of support for just saying we actually need to eliminate this hundred billion dollars uh, in total over time, right? Uh, not necessarily overnight. Um, so we hope that folks who feel like uh, police are being relied on to do too many basic public services that they're not trained to do, and that we'd rather have some of those duties handled by nonviolent specialists trained in either social work, education, drug counseling, or mental health, whatever it may be, you should be able to support significant structural decreases in our policing system. So you're going to hear lots of policy proposals over the coming you know, months and years um, that are just not aligned with this defund or divest and invest uh, demand. So it's important that you understand the difference. There is 
zero empirical evidence that body cameras, for example, um, on officers, de-escalation training, and anti-bias training for officers uh, reduce the depth and scope of the police department's power. In fact, most of those popular reforms uh, and the ones that were seen proposed by, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, all sorts of politicians, we'll just say across the spectrum, uh, actually uphold or even expand the reach of policing. So remember when George Floyd was killed by the Minneapolis Police Department um, by an officer, they, the Minneapolis police officer had every single one of those reforms in place and they were ineffective and insufficient in saving George Floyd's life. Um, the only way to reduce police violence is re to reduce the size, scope, and role of the police department in day-to-day -day life. Uh, and you all, if you remember back to your visions of safety, your best days for the most part did not involve police. So it echoes like that we should not be uh, investing in a strategy that's not proven and also is just not what we uh, envision when we really put, set our hearts on what we can create uh, together as a society. Uh, so we're not pushing uh, for spending money to outfit cops and body cameras. Nope. That is not a divest and invest strategy. We are not pushing for expanding community policing and putting officers on nice bikes all over our communities. We are not pushing for the more training of police without a commitment to decreasing the police system uh, and the number of officers. We are not pushing for civilian review and oversight boards without a commitment to decreasing policing because that often just gives more authority to a police um, uh, force in a community. We are not accepting the jailing of killer cops as success without a commitment to decrease the police system. All right, uh, so when you hear those strategies lifted up, I hope that you will like help bring back to this divest and invest model um, and really push for significant decreases, tens, and, uh, tens or hundreds of million dollars per, per city um, structural decrease in the size of the policing budget. Uh, we know that this will work uh, and that we can win. Uh, in only a few weeks after, the George, after George Floyd was killed uh, by the Minneapolis police, we've already seen a demand for defund and invest begin to lead to real change. So in Minnesota, a, veto, a veto-proof ma majority in the Minneapolis City Council uh, pledged that they would take steps to disband the police department um, and have voted on that. Um, and uh, this would not abolish the police in Minneapolis, but uh, it would be a tremendous opening for the sh uh, for you know the struggle around creating alternatives. Also, the Minneapolis school board ended their contract with police, a victory for the wider cops and schools movement. And we've seen that across the country pan out in many different places. That the first uh, willingness was to say, you know, at a minimum, our police don't need to be in our schools. That that actually does not make our our children safer. Um, so uh, we're gonna drop in the chat. Um, there are some uh, sets of demands that are coming out. Movement for Black Lives, and for bl our, our partner has an Invest Divest platform, for example, that you can check out. Uh, and it has um, you know, a commitment to a relocation of funds at the federal, state, and local level from policing and incarceration to long-term safety strategies, such as education, restorative justice, and employment programs a cut in military expenditures and a reallocation of those funds to invest in the domestic infrastructure um, of our community. You should know that in the last stimulus, over $850 million in our, what was supposed to be re relief for our communities was spent on policing, all right? And I think we can do better, uh, spent, you know, at the federal level, but also at the local level. Uh, so we will get you that link so that you can check out M4BL's demands, uh, but also each lo many local communities, right, are gonna have to tailor these requests. Um, and on that website, it actually lists out what did Minneapolis pursue, what did St. Louis pursue, and kind of what are some different communities' interpretations of this defund or divest invest uh, uh, strategy. So, um, yep, it's possible. <laughs> um, we're going to ask a similar question. Where, where are folks standing now that they have a little better clarity, hopefully, on what defund actually means? Uh, we hope that we've won you across on, on some of these things. Yep, so now is the time. Um, we hope that folks will say that reforms like spending more on body cameras and police and training are not enough, that we actually need to shrink the police system. 
Uh, and some of you may be in a spot that says, you know what, I actually want to study more abolitionist theory. There are organizations like Critical Resistance that actually do a, a whole depth of teaching around that particular theory that says that actually, no, we, we, can, we can actually build uh, peaceful communities uh, without police intervention and with restorative justice strategies exclusively. And so this uh, is starting to land how you'd expect that lots of us right now can make the mental shift to say, no, we've got to make ma massive shrinks. I, I, I want you to hold that commitment in your heart and take it into uh, your city council and your county council and your school board, because they're, uh, so, so much of that $100 billion is actually spent at the local level. Um, Steve, I think I'm going to pass it to you. Yes, and uh, just checking in on the time here, we have about 10 minutes left on the scheduled time here, and we have a little bit more to do, including we were hoping to give you one more chance to meet with your small group. Do, uh, if folks would have to leave, we would understand, but if we run a little bit late, um, how do we want to do that, Kelsey, how, Jay, Jennifer? Um, I'm inclined to say that maybe, let's just do it on the mentee instead of in groups, just to save a little bit of space. And sorry, okay. you know, not getting you to be paired up again. Okay, sounds good. All right, so this all brings us to uh, our fifth truth that we want to talk about. Um, um, are we are there you go. <laughs> um, that policing is not the tool to bring peace, health, and safety to our communities, uh, and that we must invest in other strategies now. Um, so now that we are aligning on divesting here, we'd like to hear from you, uh, what would you invest in if you could defund policing in your community to, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars or more? Um, we aren't looking for ways to reform, as Jay Knox was saying, or to make it better, we want you to think about um, if your police department had less money and less officers, where would you want that money invested such that it was addressing root causes and bringing peace, health, and safety to your communities? We won't do the small group now for time reasons, but we will uh, give you a chance to uh, answer that in Menti. education, housing for all, anti-racism education, mental health and addiction services, housing stability, crisis counselors, jobs that pay living wages, mental health, school mental health and housing, a lot of housing, mental health support services, right, housing stability, infant, child and youth and family programs, job training and education, Social services, education, community services, public health. Here's somebody saying infrastructure. My area has lots of abandoned old factories that could become office complexes to uh, services and housing. Okay. People are putting things in the chat too. Recreation. Invest in reentry to reduce return to prison, job training, universal basic income. Uh, somebody has here in the Bay Area, so much of our police energy is spent on harassing the homeless. Imagine what that shift could look like. On the gap year, so kids and teachers don't return to school during the pandemic. Um, okay. Uh, was that, that's yeah, the only. Close us out, Steve. Yeah, okay, we are, in, I wasn't sure if we had another mentee slide. So, um, we're gonna pass this back to Kelsey in just a second, but I wanna thank all of you for the time you took and the engagement you gave in this uh, rapid fire uh, training session. And we would love to remain in dialogue with you. Um, and if you want to remain in contact with the WFP, um, if we would ask you 
to uh, sign the petition that we're going to drop in the chat. Now, I know what you're thinking, petitions, petitions. We are gonna deliver this, but more importantly, if this is the kind of work that you feel is important, um, if you wanna stay in contact with us and this body of work that we are trying to move, um, this is a way for you to connect with us. So um, if you wanna connect with training opportunities or other actions on this issue, um, in my opinion, I think it's gonna take all of us together to continue building on the momentum we're seeing in the streets right now. Um, and we want you to join with us in that work together. So thank you for the time you've taken with us. And if you wanna stay in contact, if you wanna keep building with us, uh, I will drop the link to the petition. Great, and if I could just add that there are tons of ways that you can take action both on the local level uh, and on the national level and uh, across the spectrum of different activities because I know um, you know you'll maybe have different organizations that have different tax statuses uh, but uh, we are both hoping to make this uh, training available to folks who want to learn to actually facilitate it in their different spaces. So fill out that petition if you want to be uh, informed about those types of political education activities. And then also we'll let you know about other ways that you can take uh, key, you know, political action uh, on this type of issue uh, in this, you know, really critical moment in our nation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve and Jennifer from the Working Families Party and everybody please sign that petition and we'll send it again in the follow up email. You can post that on social media, send that out to your networks and ask people to join you um, in that that ask. Um, so thank you everybody for you for joining and being with us for these past two hours. We had some ups and downs, we had some uh, disruptions, but we kept going um, because we know that this is where we're supposed to be and this is the conversation that is meant to be had. So thank you for staying with us through all of that. So I wanna just give a few ways that, you know, as we move forward throughout the rest of this week and into the coming weeks, how we can stay engaged um, both locally and nationally. So first, I think it's really about connecting locally um, seeing who's already doing this work of defund and divestment and investment in your community and then connecting with your city council as well. Um, Jennifer said we have to be thoughtful, deliberate and participatory um, and moving forward defunding won't happen without us. So ask the questions, what is on the table? Has your city council already started these conversations or could you be a part of starting this conversation in your community? So be proactive and connect with the people in power in your community and show them your power and your community's power that you demand change. I also recommend that you sign up for the Movement for Black Lives newsletter and learn more about the BREATHE Act, which is a modern civil rights bill that was just um, released last week. Um, please learn more about that see what our leaders are asking for demanding and see how you can sign on to be either a community uh, supporter or an individual supporter of the breathe act um, again and sign up for the movement for black lives newsletter and then share this training with three clergy members or three people in your community you think would benefit like we said we had some disruptions i'm going to try to edit this video to make it a little cleaner um, and a little um, better for others to watch. Um, but please keep talking about this conversation. When you run into roadblocks, when people are you know, challenging you, it's an opportunity to share and you don't have to be an expert. It doesn't have to come out perfect, but you learned a lot of good resources here. We're gonna follow up with the five hard truths, with the history timeline, use the knowledge you do have and don't let um, the, the, the goal of per perfection, which is a, a characteristic of white supremacy, hold you back from educating your community and continuing to be brave and courageous and listening. So thank you all so much again for joining us. Just cherish each of you. I see all your faces um, in the, the gallery view. Really blessed to be here with you today and be on the lookout this afternoon for a follow-up email with the recording, the handout, the petition, and some of the lovely comments that we received this whole time. So truly it was a joy to be together. Um, I hope everyone has a blessed day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much.